Hi there, I'm Paul Belflem and this is Industrial Organization. This presentation is about the hoteling model. This is a stylized model of horizontal product differentiation. We want to describe the main effects which are at work and we want also to discuss alternative assumptions. If you want to read more, you can go to section 5.2 of the textbook. Let us start by describing the model in a graphical way. Okay, think of the market being described by this line from 0 to 1, which you can see as a, a street, okay, or as the dimension of some product. I will give you an example in a minute. Okay? On this street, you've got both consumers and two firms. We have to decide where to locate. Okay? Consumers are uniformly distributed along this line. So at each point uh, of the line, you would have the same uh, share of consumers. And we're talking about share of, shares of consumers here because we make this assumption without any loss of generality that the, the total number of consumers is equal to one. Okay, so we, we talk in proportions here. If, if you don't understand this, think of having 10,000 consumers uh, on this on this line, okay, um, we could use it this way, right? But we would have actually everything multiplied by 10,000, the quantities, the profits, and so on and so forth, uh, which is a bit cumbersome. So we just simplify by immediately dividing through uh, 10,000, okay, and saying in an abstract way that the number of consumers is one, but I repeat, this is the same thing as saying that we talk in terms of proportions of consumers. Okay? What is important is that they are uniformly distributed. Right? So these two firms offer the same product, but in the eyes of the consumer, so we've got one consumer here, Miss X. In the eyes of Miss X, Miss X, the two products are not the same because she has to travel to go from her position, X here, to where the shop of firm two or the shop of firm one are actually located. Okay, and traveling is costly. There is a cost which we for the moment note T of X L1. Okay, that's the cost of going from X to L1. And similarly, T of X L2 is the, tech, the cost of going from X to L2. Right, so this fits quite well with the geographical interpretation with physical cost of traveling from one point to another. Now, more broadly, this model can be interpreted in a product space. Okay? Think, for example, of the market for white wine. You could have, at one extreme, a very, very dry white wine, and on the other extreme, a very, very sweet white wine. So this line from zero to one would measure the degree of sweetness of the wine. Miss X is located here. What does a location of a consumer mean? It means that this corresponds to the preferred degree of sweetness of white wine from the point of view of Miss X. Okay, so that would be a preferred product. The problem is that here in this market there are just two types of wines which are offered. One is relatively dry, the other one is relatively sweet, uh, but they are not exactly uh, the kind of sweetness or dryness that Miss X would prefer. So she has to content herself with one or the other product and the further a product is located from her position, the larger the disutility she experiences or the reduction in utility because she doesn't get the product she prefers. Okay, so in the same way as she was, she would be experiencing the cost of physically traveling from her position to a shop, she is also experiencing a reduction in utility, a cost of traveling, quote unquote, from her preferred product to the product offered actually by one or the other firm. Okay, so this is symbolized here in this uh, uh, utility function. So the utility of Miss X of buying product I is some base utility R minus the disutility of not having a preferred product or of traveling to the shop minus the price she is paying there, and similarly for good two, or firm two. Okay, so you could see the sum of P1 plus 
t of x l1 as the total price or the generalized price that uh, Miss X is paying when buying from firm Y. And similarly, P2 plus T of X L2 is the total price of buying from firm 2. Okay, now I repeat this is a story of horizontal product differentiation because the distance to be uh, to, to be walked or the, the, the cost of going from the location of a consumer to the location of the firm, this cost makes the two products different. Okay, so the perception of the consumers is that the brands or the two products are differentiated because of this disutility from travel. Okay, so just to make sure, yet let us recap the different ingredients of the model. There is a mass one of uniformly distributed consumers on this line 0, 1. I repeat, this uniform distribution means, for example, that there are exactly one-fourth of the consumers between 0 and 0.25. Okay, and one fifth between zero and 0.5, and so on and so forth. Okay, let me also repeat that the location of a consumer can be interpreted in two ways, either in a ge geographical space or in a product space. And what I didn't say so far is that consumers have a unit demand. They buy one unit from either firm, okay, from one firm or the other. They don't have uh, uh, any demand for a second unit, so they don't buy uh, two units at the same firm or one unit from each firm by one unit maximum. Okay. Now, the game that we want to analyze is the following. Firms choose their location first, and then they choose their price. We know the location Li and the price, as usual, Pi. We suppose that they have constant marginal cost of production, and both have the same cost, C. So, naturally, because there are two stages, we look for a sub-game perfect equilibrium. So, we solve the game backwards. So we will start with the price stage and then move to the location stage. Right? And before doing any computation, we already know that at equilibrium, firms will choose different locations. Okay? This is to say that the solution where they would choose the same location cannot be part of a sub-game perfect equilibrium. The reason is very simple. If they were choosing the same location, then consumers would see the two products as totally equivalent, uh, because wherever the consumer is located, the distance to be uh, made or the, the, the cost of traveling to uh, any of the two shops would be exactly the same. Okay, so Bertrand competition would uh, follow, meaning that the prices would go down to marginal cost and the profits would go down to zero. And this is something that any firm can improve upon by choosing a different location than the other firm. Okay, so there will be some differentiation at equilibrium. The question remains how much uh, will the firms differentiate their products. Okay, So we will analyze this game by making two different assumptions regarding the transportation costs. Okay, So this function T of x L i. Now in this first interpretation we assume that this cost is linear and this is how we write it. That's tau times the, the difference between x and L i and we take the absolute value here. Uh, so that's the distance between the location of the consumer and the location of the shop. Okay, so this means that if you take the geographical in interpretation, for example, any step you walk in the street costs you exactly the same, right? And so the larger the distance, you multiply uh, the number of steps you make by a constant cost, uh, t, tau. Okay. Now at the price stage, we are not going to analyze it fully here. Uh, there is a problem, a technical problem in a sense. Uh, because you may not have a price equilibrium if the firms are located too close to each other. Okay, so remember we're looking for a sub-game perfect equilibrium. Here we're considering the second stage. So we would like to be able to say which prices the firms are going to choose for any pair of locations they've chosen before. Well, here we've got a problem. For some locations, and in particular when firms are close to one another, we don't have a price equilibrium. Okay, why don't we have a price equilibrium? Well, it's because there are uh, discontinuities in the demand functions. And just to be very short here, the problem comes from the fact that if, if one firm decreases its price a little bit below some threshold, suddenly it acquires all the consumers on the left or on the right, depending which uh, 
uh, firm you're looking at, but all the consumers which are said to be in the turf of the other firm. Okay, so let me just go back to uh, the picture here. Consider firm one. Well, the, 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 the turf of firm two is all the consumers located at the right of firm two. The turf of firm one is all the consumers located at the left of firm one. Okay, what we say here when there are linear transaction, uh, transportation costs, uh, if we consider a firm one choosing, uh, choosing its price for a given P2, uh, if it decreases its price uh, sufficiently, then at some point it acquires all these consumers here. And there is a discontinuity in the demand functions, also in the profit functions, and that explains why uh, we may not have a price equilibrium. Okay? Uh, this is because both firms find it profitable to undercut the other. And so there is never an equilibrium in prices. So it means that it's impossible then to move to the first stage of the game. Uh, we cannot solve for any choice of location because we don't know what is going to be the price equilibrium later on for some pairs of location. But what we can say is that where price, where, where price equilibrium exists, firms want to move towards the zone where the price equilibrium doesn't exist. Okay, So the, there is a form of instability in competition here. Okay, so this is the only uh, message we want to uh, take away from this case where the transportation cost is linear. This instability in competition, we will explain it later where it comes from. Okay, so this is the result I want you to take away. Although product differentiation relaxes price competition, firms may have an incentive to offer better substitutes, so uh, products which are closer to one another, in order to generate more demand, which may lead to instability in competition. Okay, so these are there are two forces here which we will describe better in what follows. Okay, now to, to kind of solve this problem of existence of equilibrium, we make an alternative assumption, and basically this is the, the contribution of uh, D'Apremont, Gapsevich and Tis, uh, or colleagues from uh, UC Louvain. Uh, they suppose instead that the transportation costs are quadratic. Okay, what does that mean? It means that the transportation costs increase with the square of the distance. Okay, so my cost uh, of going from x to li is 2 times the square of the distance, x minus li. Okay, so in words it means that the cost of traveling to the nearest shop in the geographical space interpretation or to the nearest product specification in the product space interpretation, this cost increases with distance at an increasing rate. Okay, so this is what is shown here. This is uh, the cost of traveling uh, with uh, as a function of the distance, and you see that it's increasing and increasing more and more. Okay, well, the, the technical uh, advantage of this assumption is that now the demand functions are, are continuous in prices, the profit functions as well, and so we can find a unique price equilibrium in all subgames. So for any uh, pair of locations that have been chosen in the first stage by the firms. Okay, so we can solve the puzzle basically. We start with the second stage, the price equilibrium. Okay, and for that we need to know what would be the demand expressed by the consumers for any pair of prices. Okay, so take two locations, firm 1 is there, firm 2 is there, and take two prices, P1 and P2. Now, as we saw, that what matters for the consumers is not just the price, but the, the price plus the cost of traveling. Okay, so if you move towards the right here, uh, and consider consumers which are located further away from firm 1, the total price they pay is this curve here. It's P1 plus the quadratic cost of transportation. Okay. Now you can do exactly the same for firm 2. If you move away from firm 2, uh, consumers who are located further away from firm 2 are paying a total price which is higher. It's P2 for the consumer who is just here because this consumer doesn't have to travel, but it's increasing and increasing uh, quadratically uh, if you move away. Now at some point here you've got an intersection and this is the identity of the consumer who is just indifferent between going to firm 1 or to firm 2, given the locations of the two firms and given the prices they set. Okay, so if you want to identify this consumer, uh, you need to solve this equation here. 
Uh, this is the utility, the net utility of going to firm one. This is the net utility of going to firm two. And for this consumer x hat, we have equality between the two. And if you solve for x hat, this is what you find. Okay. Now, just to analyze this expression, imagine that p1 is equal to p2. So this term here disappears, meaning that the location of the indifferent consumer is just the average between L1 and L2, okay, the middle point between the two. But if uh, the prices are different, so for example, if P2 is uh, larger than P1, okay, so this would be negative, there is a minus in front, so this whole thing would be positive, meaning that X hat would move to the right, okay, uh, meaning that there is a larger demand for firm one. So what is the demand? Remember that each consumer is buying one unit. Okay, This is the person who is indifferent. So everybody on the left of X hat is more interested in buying from firm one than in buying from firm two. Okay, So if I collect the unit demand of all these consumers, I've got a total demand for firm one at prices P1, P2 and for the locations L1, L2. Okay? And the reverse, of course, applies for all consumers on the right of X hat. They will buy from firm two, so the total demand is made of the sum of all the consumers being uh, located between X hat and Y. Okay, so coming back to the description of X hat, remember the case I was mentioning, take P2 larger than P1, so this whole uh, element here is positive, meaning that x hat is going to the right. There is a larger demand for firm 1, which makes sense because firm 2 is more expensive, has become more expensive than firm 1. Okay, so now that we know the demands for any pair of prices, we can look at the profits of the two firms, derive the profit with respect to the price, and look for a Nash equilibrium in prices. Okay, so these are the two problems of the two firms. Firm 1 is maximizing P1 minus C. This is the margin times its demand. And the demand is given by the, this indifferent consumer, all the consumers on the left of X hat. For firm 2, similarly, the, the margin is P2 minus C. And the demand is 1 minus X hat, so all the consumers on the right of X hat. Okay. Now, I will give you time to look at the details of the computations on the next two slides. Um, these are the, prof the prices sorry, that are obtained at equilibrium. It's uh, the marginal cost plus something that depends on this parameter 2, which measures how fast the transportation cost is increasing. And it depends, of course, on the locations of the two firms. Okay? Right. Um, you can freeze this. Uh, screen as long as you want to read the details of the computations. Uh, everything is there. Uh, the problem of firm 1 with the first order condition that gives you the uh, reaction function of firm 1. Similarly for firm 2, the reaction function is here. And then we need to cross the reaction functions to find the Nash equilibrium. This is what is done here. Uh, and so we find the optimal price of firm 1, which was written on the previous slide and similarly for firm 2. Okay, and we note for further reference the difference between the two prices. Right? I pause here just a little bit to allow you to freeze your screen if you want to read this at your own space, pace. Right, so once we have solved the, the price stage, we know for any location chosen by firm 1 and chosen by firm 2, which prices they will set at the second stage. Okay, And so we can move to the first stage and ask what are the locations they are going to choose, knowing that by changing the location they change the demand they receive, but also they influence the prices that they will set in the second stage. Okay, So this is what has been summarized here. We express the profit function, we call it by one hat, uh, as just a function of the locations. Okay, how did we do that? Well, we used the prices we computed as the equilibrium of the pricing stage, and we substituted them into the profit function so that the profit function is just a function of the locations. Okay? Now, if you look at firm 1 here, and 
uh, you look at how the profit changes when it changes its location L1, well, the derivative is negative, okay, everywhere, meaning that the optimum is to decrease L1 as possible, as much as possible, so to uh, use to put L1 equal to zero. Okay, so I forgot to say we solve the model assuming that L2 is larger than L1. This is what we represented on the graph before. Okay, and we can do this without any loss of generality. Now for firm 2, which is supposed to be on the right of firm 1, we do the exact same thing and we see that the profit increases in L2. Okay, so that means that firm 2 wants to push its location as far on the right as possible. Okay, and set it at 1. Okay, so what we have just found out here is that firms will differentiate in the maximal way. One firm will locate at 0 at the left end of the street or of the product space, while the other firm will locate itself at the very end on the right of the space. Okay, so there is maximum differentiation which is the result of the combination between two forces. And this is actually what is important to understand. On the one hand, there is a competition effect. Okay? And this is what we know from the start. Firms don't want to locate at the same spot because if they do so, the, the, the price uh, competition will be extremely fierce and they will make zero profit. Okay? And by extension, we understand that the closer the firms are, the stronger the price competition is or to put it in uh, the reverse, the further away the firms are from each other, the more differentiated they are, the more relaxed the competition is, meaning that they can set higher prices. Okay, so this competition effect drives competitors apart. But at the same time, firms want to maximize the, the market size. They want to meet the consumer's preferences. Okay, and if you remember the first model that we covered, where firms just care about location but don't care about prices, for example, because prices are uh, regulated. So if you remember this example of the two uh, vendors of ice cream who have to locate on the beach, uh, the, the equilibrium there was that they were locating at the exact same spot at the middle of the beach, okay? because they are both trying to maximize uh, the market size they will, uh, they will uh, serve, and that was the unique equilibrium. Well, this force is still there here, okay? It's still present here, and this uh, market size effect brings competitors together, okay? So one force is driving the two competitors to locate their, their shops or their products far away from one another, and the other force is just doing the opposite. The balance between these two forces depends on the parameters of the model, the, 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 the assumptions that we've made, in this model, with uniform distribution of consumers and with quadratic transportation cost, the first effect is always stronger than the second one, and that is, that is why we reach maximum differentiation. Okay? If you want the detailed computations behind this result, they are here. Um, this is the confirmation that the derivative of the profit of firm 1 with respect to its own location is negative and the opposite prevails for firm two. Okay, again, you can freeze this to read this at your own risk. Right, so let, let us just note for further reference in the course that at the subgame perfect equilibrium, uh, the locations of the firms are zero and one. And so the prices are quite simple. They are C plus two, they are clearly larger than C. So there, that means that the margin is positive and that translates into positive profits. It's two times one half, one half being the market share of each firm. Okay, so it's important to note here that product differentiation, which is endogenous in this model, okay, firms choose to differentiate their products, okay? Product differentiations, differentiation allows them to make positive profits. And we see here that the profits at equilibrium increase with two, so remember measures how fast the transportation cost increases. Okay? And that can be seen as the perception of the inherent differentiation between the two products. Okay? In the eyes of the consumers, uh, when TO is larger, uh, you can see this as the consumers perceiving the two brands as more differentiated. Okay? And so 
more differentiation, exogenous differentiation here, increases the market power for the firms. Let us summarize the main uh, takeaways from this uh, model with endogenous product differentiation. The degree of differentiation is determined by balancing the competition effect and the market size effect. The competition effect drives firms to increase differentiation because they want to relax price competition. And the market size effect drives firms to decrease differentiation in order to capture a larger share of the market. Okay, sorry for the word that is missing here. Now, before we close, uh, the, the balance between these two, these two effects may be different than what we have seen in this particular model. For example, if instead of having a uniform distribution of consumers, we had a more concentrated distribution around the center of the street, okay, more consumers are living there for some reason, well, of course, the market size effect would have a, 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 a larger influence here, okay, because uh, you would reach even more consumers if you move to the center of the, of the street. Okay, so what I'm saying here is that depending on the, uh, the, the assumptions you make, so depending on the, the reality of the um, industry that you're describing, you will have a different balance between these two forces, but what remains is precisely the presence of these two forces. Okay, and we will see that on the vertical differentiation, these two forces are there as well. Thanks a lot for your attention. That was a, a longer presentation, but this is a very important model that explains why firms, in reality, when they choose prices, they want to differentiate their products.